the Tsar and the Russian Empire both used forced exile and forced labor as forms of judicial punishment. Katorga, a category of punishment which was reserved for those who were convicted of the most serious crimes, had many of the features which were associated with labor camp imprisonment, confinement, simplified facilities, as opposed to the facilities which existed in prisons, and forced labor, usually involving hard, unskilled or semi-skilled work. According to historian Ann Applebaum, Katorga was not a common sentence. Approximately 6,000 Katorga convicts were serving sentences in 1906 and 28,600 in 1916. Under the Imperial Russian penal system, those who were convicted of less serious crimes were sent to corrective prisons and they were also made to work. Forced exile to Siberia had been in use for a wide range of offences since the 17th century, and it was a common punishment for political dissidents and revolutionaries. In the 19th century, the members of the failed Decembrist revolt and Polish nobles who resisted Russian rule were sent into exile. Fyodor Dostoevsky was sentenced to die for reading banned literature in 1849, but the sentence was commuted to banishment to Siberia. Members of various socialist revolutionary groups, including Bolsheviks such as Sergo Ordzonikids, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and Joseph Stalin were also sent into exile. Convicts who were serving labor sentences and exiles were sent to the underpopulated areas of Siberia and the Russian Far East, regions that lacked towns or food sources as well as organized transportation systems. Despite the isolated conditions, some prisoners successfully escaped to populated areas. Stalin himself escaped three of the four times after he was sent into exile. Since these times, Siberia gained its fearful connotation as a place of punishment, a reputation which was further enhanced by the Soviet gulag system. The Bolsheviks' own experiences with exile and forced labor provided them with a model which they could base their own system on, including the importance of strict enforcement. From 1920 to 1950, the leaders of the Communist Party and the Soviet state considered repression a tool that they should use to secure the normal functioning of the Soviet state system and preserve and strengthen their positions within their social base. The working class, when the Bolsheviks took power, peasants represented 80% of the population. In the midst of the Russian Civil War, Lenin and the Bolsheviks established a special prison camp system, separate from its traditional prison system and under the control of the Chika. These camps, as Lenin envisioned them, had a distinctly political purpose. These early camps of the Gulag system were introduced in order to isolate and eliminate class alien, socially dangerous, disruptive, suspicious, and other disloyal elements, whose deeds and thoughts were not contributing to the strengthening of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Forced labor as a method of re-education was applied in the Solovy prison camp as early as the 1920s, based on Trotsky's experiments with forced labor camps for Czech war prisoners from 1918 and his proposals to introduce compulsory labor service voiced in terrorism and communism. Various categories of prisoners were defined, petty criminals, POWs of the Russian Civil War, officials accused of corruption, sabotage and embezzlement, political enemies, dissidents and other people deemed dangerous for the state. In the first decade of Soviet rule, the judicial and penal systems were neither unified nor coordinated, and there was a distinction between criminal prisoners and political or special prisoners. The traditional judicial and prison system, which dealt with criminal prisoners, were first overseen by the People's Commissariat of Justice until 1922, after which they were overseen by the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs, also known as the NKVD. The Chika and its successor organizations, the GPU or State Political Directorate and the OGPU, oversaw political prisoners and the special camps to which they were sent. In April 1929, the judicial distinctions between criminal and political prisoners were eliminated and control of the entire Soviet penal system turned over to the OGPU. In 1928, there were 30,000 individuals interned, the authorities were opposed to compelled labor. In 1927, the official in charge of prison administration wrote, the exploitation of prison labor, the system of squeezing golden sweat from them, the organization of production in places of confinement, which while profitable from a commercial point of view is fundamentally lacking in corrective significance. These are entirely inadmissible in Soviet places of confinement. The legal base and the guidance for the creation of the system of corrective labor camps, Spravitalno Trudo vi Ligeria, the backbone of what is commonly referred to as the Gulag, was a secret decree from the Sovnarkom of July 11, 1929.
about the use of penal labor that duplicated the corresponding appendix to the minutes of the Politburo meeting of June 27, 1929. One of the Gulag system founders was Naftali Frenkel. In 1923 he was arrested for illegally crossing borders and smuggling. He was sentenced to 10 years hard labor at Salovi, which later came to be known as the first camp of the Gulag. While serving his sentence he wrote a letter to the camp administration detailing a number of productivity improvement proposals including the infamous system of labor exploitation whereby the inmates' food rations were to be linked to their rate of production, a proposal known as nourishment scale. This notorious you-eat-as-you-work system would often kill weaker prisoners in weeks and caused countless casualties. The letter caught the attention of a number of high communist officials including Genrik Yagoda, and Frankel soon went from being an inmate to becoming a camp commander and an important gulag official. His proposal soon saw widespread adoption in the gulag system. After having appeared as an instrument and place for isolating counter-revolutionary and criminal elements, the gulag, because of its principle of correction by forced labor, quickly became, in fact, an independent branch of the national economy secured on the cheap labor force presented by prisoners. Hence it is followed by one more important reason for the constancy of the repressive policy, namely, the state's interest in unremitting rates of receiving a cheap labor force that was forcibly used, mainly in the extreme conditions of the East and North. The Gulag possessed both punitive and economic functions. The Gulag, a Russian acronym for main administration of camps, was a vast network of forced labor camps throughout the Soviet Union. These camps, established in 1918, operated until 1987 and housed millions of prisoners, including political dissidents, criminals, and victims of ethnic persecution. The Gulag camp system was created by Vladimir Lenin in 1918, shortly after the Russian Revolution. However, it was under Joseph Stalin's rule that the Gulag system became truly vast and brutal. The number of prisoners skyrocketed during the 1930s, driven by Stalin's political purges and forced collectivization policies. While the Gulag system began to be dismantled after Stalin's death in 1953, it was not officially abolished until 1987, under the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. The Gulag was an administration body that watched over the camps, eventually its name would be used for these camps retrospectively. After Lenin's death in 1924, Stalin was able to take control of the government and began to form the Gulag system. On June 27, 1929, the Politburo created a system of self-supporting camps that would eventually replace the existing prisons around the country. These prisons were meant to receive inmates that received a prison sentence that exceeded three years. Prisoners that had a shorter prison sentence than three years were to remain in the prison system that was still under the purview of the NKVD. The purpose of these new camps was to colonize the remote and inhospitable environments throughout the Soviet Union. These changes took place around the same time that Stalin started to institute collectivization and rapid industrial development. Collectivization resulted in a large-scale purge of peasants and so-called kulaks. The kulaks were supposedly wealthy, comparatively to other Soviet peasants, and were considered to be capitalists by the state, and by extension enemies of socialism. The term would also become associated with anyone who opposed or even seemed unsatisfied with the Soviet government. By late 1929 Stalin began a program known as deculakization. Stalin demanded that the kulak class be completely wiped out, resulting in the imprisonment and execution of Soviet peasants. In a mere four months, 60,000 people were sent to the camps and another 154,000 exiled. This was only the beginning of the deculakization process, however. In 1931 alone 1,803,392 people were exiled. Although these massive relocation processes were successful in getting a large potential free, forced labor workforce where they needed to be, that is about all it was successful at doing. The special settlers, as the Soviet government referred to them, all lived on starvation level rations, and many people starved to death in the camps, and anyone who was healthy enough to escape tried to do just that. This resulted in the government having to give rations to a group of people they were getting hardly any use out of, and was just costing the Soviet government money. The unified state political administration quickly realized the problem and began to reform the deculakization process. To help prevent the mass escapes the OGPU started to recruit people within the colony to help stop people who attempted to leave, and set up ambushes around known popular escape routes.
The OGPU also attempted to raise the living conditions in these camps that would not encourage people to actively try and escape, and Kulaks were promised that they would regain their rights after five years. Even these revisions ultimately failed to resolve the problem, and the deculicization process was a failure in providing the government with a steady forced labor force. These prisoners were also lucky to be in the Gulag in the early 1930s. Prisoners were relatively well off compared to what the prisoners would have to go through in the final years of the Gulag. The Gulag was officially established on April 25, 1930, as the Gulag by the OGPU Order 130, 63 in accordance with the Sovnarkom Order 22, page 248, dated April 7, 1930. It was renamed as the Gulag in November of that year. It is estimated that between 18 and 20 million people were imprisoned in the Gulag camps throughout their history. Millions of these prisoners died from starvation, disease, overwork, or execution. The 1931-32 archives indicate the Gulag had approximately 200,000 prisoners in the camps, while in 1935, approximately 800,000 were in camps and 300,000 in colonies. Gulag population reached a peak value, 1.5 million, in 1941 gradually decreased during the war and then started to grow again, achieving a maximum by 1953. Besides gulag camps, a significant amount of prisoners, which confined prisoners serving short sentence terms. The population of gulag camps, blue, and gulag colonies, red, in 1934-53. In the early 1930s, a tightening of the Soviet penal policy caused a significant growth of the prison camp population. During the Great Purge of 1937-38, mass arrests caused another increase in inmate numbers. Hundreds of thousands of persons were arrested and sentenced to long prison terms on the grounds of one of the multiple passages of the notorious Article 58 of the Criminal Codes of the Union Republics, which defined punishment for various forms of counter-revolutionary activities. Under NKVD Order No. 00447, Tens of thousands of gulag inmates were executed in 1937-38 for continuing counter-revolutionary activities. Between 1934 and 1941, the number of prisoners with higher education increased more than eight times, and the number of prisoners with higher education increased five times. It resulted in their increased share in the overall composition of the camp prisoners. Among the camp prisoners, the number and share of the intelligentsia was growing at the quickest pace. Distrust, hostility, and even hatred for the intelligentsia was a common characteristic of the Soviet leaders. Information regarding the imprisonment trends and consequences for the intelligentsia derived from the extrapolations of Viktor Zemskov from a collection of prison camp population movements data. The Gulag was not just a place of suffering, it was also a tool of political repression. The Soviet government used the camps to silence its critics and intimidate the population. Millions of innocent people were arrested and imprisoned on trumped-up charges or for simply expressing dissenting opinions. The Gulag system was vast and complex, encompassing thousands of camps across the Soviet Union. Some camps were large and well-organized, while others were small and improvised. The conditions varied depending on the location, the time period, and the specific camp administration. The Gulag was not a single entity, but rather a network of camps with varying degrees of severity. Some camps were primarily focused on forced labor, while others were used for political imprisonment or punishment. The Gulag population fluctuated over time. The number of prisoners peaked in the 1930s during Stalin's Great Terror, but it declined significantly after his death. The Gulag played a significant role in the Soviet economy. The forced labor of prisoners contributed to the development of various industries, including mining, logging, and construction. Despite the horrors they endured, many prisoners found ways to resist and maintain their humanity. They formed underground organizations, engaged in acts of sabotage, and shared stories and poems to keep their spirits alive. Almost immediately after the death of Stalin, the Soviet establishment started to dismantle the Gulag system. A mass general amnesty was granted in the immediate aftermath of Stalin's death but it was only offered to non-political prisoners and political prisoners who had been sentenced to a maximum of five years in prison. Shortly thereafter, Nikita Khrushchev was elected first secretary, initiating the processes of destalinization and the Khrushchev thaw, triggering a mass release and rehabilitation of political prisoners. Six years later, on the 25th of January, 1960, the Gulag system was officially abolished when the remains of its administration were dissolved by Khrushchev, 
the legal practice of sentencing convicts to penal labor continues to exist in the Russian Federation, but its capacity is greatly reduced. Conditions in the Gulag were brutal and inhumane. 